Welcome back, peeps, to Perfect.dev, where we give you cats the freshest dose of dev snacks. Now with your amazing hosts, Alex Patterson and Brittany Postma. This episode brought to you by Storyblock. Build anything and publish everywhere. Welcome back, everyone, to the Garden Cat Dev Podcast. I hope that video played for everybody. It uh, played and froze everything for me. So here we are. Alex is uh, off watching a football game, which how dare he leave and go watch a football game. But I have the amazing Clark Sell with me today to talk about how to create a conference and maybe even dive a little deeper into that and how communities are created and affected by things that are going on. How are you today, Clark? I'm doing great. And I saw the uh, the very <laughs> euphoric opening I love the music. It usually like makes me balance and like gets me all yeah. excited. And I was just like, why are you frozen? Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I was, I was jamming. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Hopefully it went well for everyone, but i um, so glad to have you today. Do you want to tell us just a little about yourself, how you got into that community and that conference and how all this started? Uh, yeah. So uh, Clark Sell. Uh, father, husband, uh, live in the Midwest, um, started that conference 12, 13 years ago. Um, historically trained software engineer, loves felt, built all of that stuff in Svelte. What else? Half, half old. I don't know. That's enough for me because you said love felt. I mean, yeah. You're, you're in. We're right. actually doing a rewrite of Coding Cat Dev right now in Svelte Kit too, so I'm excited about that. <laughs> yeah, I have yet to have yet to work on the V1 final. But you have your site in Svelte Kit already. You just haven't. Yep. Updated oh, yeah. everything yet? Yeah. I've been through all of the upgrades, wow. all of from Svelte to Svelte Kit to. I mean, it's been a three-year. It's three years. Yeah, it's almost three years old at this point. So, something. Yeah. yeah, a little over. NPM update has happened many times. Yeah, and it's it's been a slog, but it's been good. I mean, we've been going through all of the uh, changes and making sure that everything gets updated. And there was the big one earlier this summer. I know that one caused oh. a big stir, but. <laughs> <laughs> It was one of two that really uh, punched me in the gut, but they were good. Like I don't, I don't have any disagreements with what happened. It's just whew, yeah. exactly. It was just rough, whew. but we're finally there. So, hey Anthony, how's it going? Good to see you. This is Hope why I test in production. Happened. I'm sorry. That's why I test in production, so I make sure everything. Yeah, fine. you just ship your code and just hope it works. That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> How in the world could I forget about this? There's no need to freak out. We have Storyblock. Robert, you're right. But we still need a plan. Okay, how much time do we have left until the launch? 24 hours. Okay, let's go. We are ready to publish. So let's get this baby online. All right. Well, like I said, we're here to talk about like starting a conference, starting a community and how all of that works. So how did you get into this? How did this all start for you? Uh, I guess kind of backwards. Um, you know, I, I didn't set out to be a conference organizer or an event organizer by any stretch. Um, back then, earlier version of me, I was doing a lot of speaking and in user groups and just trying to help the, just trying to help, right? Mm -hmm. And I was a little miffed with how, I don't want to say that our, our kind of local upper Midwest community was broken, but I had been to enough other regions where like there was a pretty tight knit group of folks who were helping one another out. And, you know, I live outside of Chicago, so geographically you have Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison, like all these big cities. And then you have all these 
tech stacks, Ruby and .NET and whatever, whatever, whatever. And nobody was really playing with one another. And I just was like, well, that's just stupid. So let's, um, you know, how do we get folks to everybody to get together and just help one another and create exposure for kids and um, uh, spouses and all that. And let's find a, you know, a fun place to do it. So, um, and yes, St. Louis, it's there. Yeah. It's in the uh, Midwest. It's, it's Midwest. Um, and so, you know, we set out to start a conference. I mean, we set out to get everybody together and quickly that became, well, now you have to sign a contract, right? And then you're like, oh shit, I got to sign a contract. So then you create a company because you're like, oh, the company will, that'll save everything, right? That'll keep me safe, which is all poor shit. So, um, so then we had an event um, and it kind of, it kind of grew over time and, you know, the, the mission then and is still as today is how do you, how do you have a family friendly event that uh, meets a polyglot set of individuals who want to help one another grow and um, you have a community, right? And I look at the event as a family reunion. So this is when we get together in person and we get to do things and when we're online, we get to do things that are online, but um, the two shouldn't really be confused. And so over the years, we've just tried to curate the community and build it up and it's ebb and flowed and the uh, pandemic was not great for anybody. <laughs> uh, and, you know, here we sit today as, you know, a community, a conference, a business, uh, struggling, not struggling, you know, kind of all the things. So kind of going back and forth, there was kind of a lot to unpack there. So let's yeah. start with the, why choose to make a company? So you founded an LLC. Nope. Because that had no. been smart. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we ended up creating a corporation. So it was C Corp. Oh, okay. Because, um, I'm not sure we thought that it would have more um, personal safety, if you will. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I looked doesn't. into this a little bit, like back when I was doing freelancing and wanting to start my own business. And yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That, that was horrible advice. Um, <laughs> so, so we have a corporation, we got our not-for-profit status, another kind of disaster in the making, which should have never really happened, but did maybe saved us, maybe not, um, has caused other problems. But um, early on, that was, I mean, the naivety of all this was, comp I don't want to sign a contract. A comp we need to have a company. The company does. Yeah. Um, we went into the first year. I think the first year was a $100,000 event, maybe a little bit more. And um, we went in upside down. Um, and then we realized that we really, really needed to treat it not just as a community, but we couldn't, we had to recognize that it's also a business, right? Like mm -hmm. my house is on the line. So yeah. we have to make sure that the right money's raised. Now, back then, right, it, it was all volunteer and it's still, there's still a lot of volunteer pieces to it, but, um, you know, $100,000 then, 12 years ago, right? That's a big chunk of change. Now you're talking, you know, close to a million dollars. And that's, I ain't got that kind of money. So No. And so let's talk about where that money usually comes from. So I don't know if everyone realizes that most conferences pay for speakers, possibly to even speak at the conference, but their travel, their accommodations, paying for everybody that you have coming to the conference. And like you said, you have some volunteers, some people that help out, but most of that money goes to them, but do you reach out and get sponsors? How do you get money to cover this? So let's first talk about the money piece, like the cost piece. And I, you know, to frame it, we're, I would say that we're in the middle, right? If you have user groups and kind of code camps on one spectrum, and then you have big for-profit multi-million dollar shows like 
a Microsoft or an AWS, they're in the other spectrum. And we're clearly in the middle of that, right? Whether that's a good thing or bad thing to be debated. Um, <laughs> so the money aspect, um, I say we're in the middle because typically somebody like us has some kind of contract with a resort or some large facility. So now you're in the, call it big adult pants of, multi-year contracts and legalities around how you use food, who serves it, those types of things. So when you break down, when we break down the costs, we kind of break them down into a few different areas. We, we talk about things like your fixed cost per ticket. So I can take food and I can kind of adjust that dial. Mm -hmm. uh, but what people don't realize is you're at a resort. So that's like $50 a plate. Yeah, it's absurd, but that's what it is. And you have resort taxes on top of that and or service fees. And then you have, you know, a huge staff in the back who's trying to pump out a thousand dishes, whatever. Um, so you have that kind of fixed stuff, a t-shirt. Then you have some, uh, uh, that's a little bit more variable, I guess, because you can kind of dial that around. Then you have some fixed stuff like a t-shirt, your production costs, those Let's say if production costs are thirty thousand dollars for the event, you know, once you've covered that thirty grand, you're not you don't have to continue to pay for it like you would food. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, speakers, there's some costs we don't cover the entirety of that, um, but still, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, depending on which show we're talking about. Um, and then um, marketing and business expenses and you know all the things of the like. So. We split the revenue side into two parts, the, the, the ticket income and then sponsorships. And uh -huh. sponsorships, so tickets, the way the company's designed is that tickets should cover the cost of running the event and sponsorships should cover the cost of kind of the company and marketing and everything else that's there. And sometimes if the sponsorships are enough, depending on wherever that also helps offset the ticket costs and things like that. So it's, it's a way of, um, it's a way of, uh, I took that model from a company called charity water where every bottle of water you buy builds a well and a hundred percent of it. And then they go seek funding for the operational costs of things. So, you know, it's today, like, it's a great model. You fast forward to today, inflation, there's a whole bunch of factors right now. And it's kind of just throwing a bomb in the middle of all of it. Yeah. I, th I think a lot of things have kind of went wrong over the last few years for in-person <laughs> events. Right. But I mean, the money is one of the things that's hard. So ideally ticket sales would cover the cost of the event. Ticket sales at a certain, at a certain number. Right. One ticket sale obviously wouldn't cover it. And no, kind of but, where we're yeah. at, it's multiple hundreds that that do it. And then as you have more, you can do more. But and then so, the same token sponsorships you need and there's their costs and printing costs and all kinds of other shit on top of that. So how do you determine how many tickets you need to sell? And then what happens if tickets don't sell? Well, you just went right to it. <laughs> Um, so I will say until we, until last year, when we took on Texas, um, we've never, we've never been under in our, in our ticket numbers. Um, oh, okay. Last year was the first time with Texas that we were under. And right now with the upcoming event in a couple of weeks, we're under. So the, how we, the unfortunate part is running a, conference is kind of a catch 22 remember mm -hmm. the old game of check-in you ride your bike at each each other who's the first one to kind of spin off yeah. well you go get a bunch of speakers right with, for texas we have 70 this year 74 well you you hope right in wisconsin we do 150 you hope that that set of people has some attraction to things but the reality is, is there's really four kind of pillars of a conference, which we can come back to. But people buy tickets 
for a set of reasons. One is educational in, in nature. And so, and they have to go get it justified by their company if their company's paying for it. So they're going to say, hey, I'm going to go see these three people and they're whatever. Maybe they're famous, maybe they're not. It's a whole nother conversation. Um, <laughs> but they have to justify their cost to go get their money to, to buy the ticket. Before that even happens, you have to have a venue, right? Which means you have to have, chances are you have to have a multi-year contract that allocates that space. And the minute you sign on the line, you owe them. Yeah, And it, it only becomes more as you get closer to set event. So let's say you sign a three-year contract and you, you sign today and you say, cool, I don't want to do it on a third year. Then you, they say, okay, well, you only owe us maybe 20 grand for the third year. And maybe it's 40 for the second year and it's 80 for this year. But as you get closer and closer to the event, you know, that 80 now becomes 160 because you have to cover the expected revenue that you're guaranteeing to get. Yeah. Right. But then if you don't sell tickets, you're still on the hook for the shit, right? You still, yeah, have because the resort has to save all of those spaces for you. That's right. And yep. So and so you, yep. So you have, you know, uh, commitments to meet for room nights, you have food commitments, you have, um, whatever. I mean, you got to sign and then you have to kind of slice it in time. So you need your production guys to be available during that week. You need your printer to have capacity during that time. You need this and that and the other. So you get all these moving pieces together and, you know, um, Carrie, my business partner, um, you know, we sit down and we have a lot of past data, so it's a little easier now, but you say, okay, well, if shirts are going to be this and food's going to be this and this, you know, what does it look like in the magic spreadsheet of budget and, you know, how many tickets would it take to become net positive and how much, what's our run rate of this? I mean, business shit, right? How do you, how do you balance a budget and all the things that go along with it. The problem is there's just lots of zeros, right? We're not, you know, a twenty thousand dollar code camp and a eight hundred thousand dollar event are not the same in in any stretch of the regard and any stretch of the imagination. So yeah. so yeah, it's a lot of moving pieces and things that have to be aligned and paid for up front. And so even if tickets don't sell, like you don't know that ahead of time. So you have, you're on the hook for lots of things there. It's, it's and you don't rough. get, and you don't get to do the event without paying for it. Yeah. So you pay before you get on, on site. So whether you have it or not, you're going to pay for it one way or another. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let's dig into what you think has happened. And I mean, we all know like COVID happened that probably affected a lot of like in-person things. How did that affect those conferences? And do you think that's still what's happening or what is going on with like ticket sales still being down? Um, <clears throat> somebody said in the chat said, it was great for virtual communities. Um, <laughs> it's interesting because I, I think it was great for virtual communities for like a hot minute and then it, everybody got fatigued and they're like dying. Um, I, it, you, you have to look, every, everything right now has become so sensitive and so bipolar that it's almost like you cannot do anything without offending somebody. So yeah. I, we had contracts and things for Texas long before COVID happened, right? Long before the political nature of COVID happened. And yet I get told all the time about how I'm a super spreader, how I'm killing people, how I'm making it unsafe for folks to travel. And it's like, I, we're all adults, right? I don't know. I don't know at what point did you think that we somehow as humans have switched to this um, very radical set of thinking, right? So I think about, I think about, so let me take this 
and we look at it by industry, right? Because I have to step back and say, is what we're doing still right? Yeah. Is what we're doing still valued? Um, so you step back by industry, and there's two industries that kind of that seem to lag behind everybody else, which is healthcare and tech. And then you have to take tech and you have to divide it in, I don't want to say in half, but we'll say West Coast, Central, and, and maybe East Coast. And it's really, really clear. And I'm not, I'm not trying to offend anybody by this. It's just what I've seen is that the West Coast is a little bit more sensitive, if you will, to travel and that than maybe the people in the Central region and Central Heartland, whatever you want to call them, mm-hmm. of America, flyover states, Rust Belt, I don't know. <laughs> and so I have people who are like, can't wait to get together. And then I have people that are like, haven't left their house, literally have told me they have yet to leave their house because they're afraid that there's bodies outside. And I'm like, you got to go, you got to go outside. Like, this is not, this is not healthy. So, so, so you're dealing with this hypersensitive kind of just state of the world. And, um, and so pandemic comes, right? It creates that. And then the online thing kind of blows up. Yeah. And now we have relationships that have been formed online, which are good. Like you and I have met as a result online but we have yet to meet in real life yeah. and it's different, right? What you do in real life and what you can do online shouldn't, shouldn't be seen as the same. And a lot of people are, they believe that now that they're working from home and they're isolating a little bit more that they don't need any of this stuff. And for some that may be true, but what I, I'm seeing more is like more depression, more like not deep relationships, just very surface level stuff. So yeah. when we really get into the shit and we're like, hey, how's it going? They're like, my life's a wreck. And he's like, great. Can you just like get out, go see people, right? Now, I, you see like all the online stuff going, but now everybody has fatigue, so now nobody wants to go online, right? And I'm, I'm, going, I'm peeing broad strokes, of course, but it, that's an issue, right? Online, I'm, I'm a full believer of find, find your tribe, set of tribes, find where they're at, and then be there and be present both online and in person. I mm-hmm. can't make that conference in person be what that conference is online. The two things are completely different. We've never tried to make them pixel parody because it doesn't work. Yeah. My, my belief. So, okay, cool. So then Twitter happens, right? Twitter being Elon Musk. So now you have, now you have all of this. It's on fire again. And, And again, I have a lot of things to say about social media. It could burn on the ground. I don't care. Something else would start. But here's what happened. Everybody, I shouldn't say everybody dispersed. People dispersed. We already had smaller communities like little Discord things and Slack things and this and that. And then Elon comes in and everybody goes, oh, well, Mastodon's the thing or this, right? Okay, great. I couldn't figure out why Mastodon did not work for me until a couple of weeks ago. Somebody goes, it's the HOA of... It's the HOA of uh, social media. <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit, you're right. Like, now it makes sense. Then everybody's like, yeah. oh, decentralized social media. It's like, no, it's just more Facebook groups. It's more it's just this, more managed. like more. Yeah, it's more little circles of echo chambers, mm-hmm. right, that aren't necessarily seeing a larger reality, which you could do in Twitter as well. I'm not saying Twitter's the right place by any stretch, but at least if I wanted a different perspective, I could try to seek it out, right? I could try to seek other things out that are there, or I could, I could look through the, through the window, if you will. Yeah. Um, but now everybody's dispersed. 
So I sit here in, in full transparency and go, I'm screwed. I'm trying to get people together and everybody's like Separation. gone and they won't, I, I can't let you in my community because you smell like you want to make money off of us. And I'm like, if you own me, like I'm trying, I'm literally trying to help you. And, and now you have walled gardens all over the place. So I, I'm genuinely concerned because I'm seeing user groups disappear. And I think as these, as these groups kind of form, which nothing wrong with it, if, as long as you get out of them, um, then my, my peer group of organizers, I mean, you can't run a million dollar conference and not have everybody show up. Like it's not going to work. Yeah. And you're just trying to bring everybody together that have different perspectives or different interests and like bring everyone into the same place and just enjoy that. And you said that you have an in-person, you have a virtual event and they're different, but you get something that might be different than what you normally see from that. I, I, and I'm not saying that what's happening right now is wrong because I would hope that our evolution would lead us to a place that's better, right? We can look at every social media thing and say, this is hot garbage because of this. This one's hot garbage because of that. This one's great because of this. This one's great because of that. But when people confuse their online life following people they've talked to, to an in-person people who you could call on the phone and get like legitimate help. Help. Yeah. That's not, it's not the same. They're very superficial relationships that are just surface level and you don't have deep connections and you're missing that as like a human being, we need those deep connections and people that you can turn to when shit hits the fan because it will eventually. Right. The 4,000 people that follow me on Twitter don't know my kid's name. Yeah. Okay. Maybe two do. I don't know. Like (laughs) whatever. Right. Like the the large, the vast majority couldn't pick me on a crowd and that's fine. I've gained a little weight over COVID, but it's, you, you just, so then I sit, so then I'd sit here and I go, what the, what the hell am I doing? And I, and I ask, I ask people like, how are you investing in yourself? Like, are you expecting somebody else to invest in you so that you get ahead? Like, are you, are you literally just like doom scrolling through YouTube because that's how you think you're going to learn this versus like get out and like do it. Yeah. Do you think you're going to work at home all alone forever? Cause that shit's not going to be the case. Yeah, I think that's true, Anthony. He said that he it's possible to make deep relationships or deep connections online. I think you have to put in more time and more effort than you would normally if you were in person just connecting with people face to face. Yes, and it's different and you have to recognize it's different and you have to yeah. do things that are different. Like you and I, he said intentionality, absolutely. You're not going to be have deep connections with thousands of people. Yeah. You're going to pick and choose deep connections with a, a, a set of few, right? So if you, you put them on <laughs> my talk started ground, I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> 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 so then you have like this level of like acquaintance, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know what comes after acquaintance, right? <laughs> Friend, BFF, like those, those are all, things you have to do or the things that you end up in. And the intentionality part is it's so hard to be intentional. Not that it's not impossible, but the energy that is exerted to be consistent um, is, is work. And how, how many people want to put in the work? I, I mean, I do like, I, I mean, you've already got, you you already gave me your phone number. <laughs> Sucks to be you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I 
I was responding to Anthony, but uh, yeah, so at Jamstack Comp, I went to Jamstack Comp and in person there, um, I was talking to, who was I talking to? Um, maybe it was Ryan Carniato, some, like, because you're into solid now, Anthony, and I was like talking to somebody and I was like, Anthony is like the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon for web development because it's like, how many people do we go through before we get to Anthony? <laughs> I, you know, surprisingly, that's kind of the tech world in general. I mean, yeah. people think tech is so big and so like mature, but when you look at it against construction and healthcare and all, you realize, <laughs> no, 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 oh, no. Super yeah. small, very immature in the grand scheme of things. Um, and it's, I mean, whatever. Like it, it is what it is, but you're very right. It's very, you were only seven degrees away from like <laughs> Bill Gates or Elon or this person or that person. It's, yeah. It's not, Absolutely. it's not It's crazy. Yeah. So um, let's get back to the conference and the community piece, because I want to talk about the pillars and find out more about like basically the pillars of any community and find out more what your thoughts are on that. So Again, this represents my thoughts, um, and I, and I don't, I don't want to offend folks that think different. But hey, I seem to be in that business these days. But I think there are, like a stool, there are four pillars that hold the stool up, and some of this is my own. I like that metaphor. Word. So you have members, right? These are just the people who make up the community. You have contributors. These are people who are active at a given point in time. And a, a contributor is also a member. At least you would hope that that's the case. Um, you have sponsors, right? There is a financial side to doing this. Just like you and I are talking now, you have to pay for StreamYard. You have to pay for hosting. Your time costs money, whatever. And then vanguards, right? These are the people who are kind of curating it. Right. These are these are the folks that are trying to grow it, trying to reach out to new folks, whatnot. And I deal with a lot of speakers. I'll I'll sometimes get, you know, well, without me, you don't have anything. And I'm like, no, that's not really true. I mean, without an audience, you don't have anything to speak to. Without a venue or a place, you don't have a format. Like like all these things, they're all intertwined. Um, Have you heard of Orbit? Yes. Yeah. that It sounds very similar to how everything like orbits around and your community is like different levels getting closer to the center. I, we, we may or may not have our platform plugged into Orbit so that we can try to understand who really the yeah. health of our community so yeah, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> but that's not, I actually, these were things I came up with um, long before that even existed. And it was in part because when I was thinking of that, that us and like, how do you really connect people? Um, then you have to understand how can it can help people work and how they want to be involved and where they ebb and flow between things because um if you don't understand each of those motives, right, um, then you're not necessarily serving the people, right? I mean, ultimately, we are a service, right? We are trying to service folks. So um, it's, uh, it's hard, right? People change throughout their time of whether they're a contributor or not. Yeah. Con contribution, we often think contribution is just – you know, like a speaker, but a lot of times the contribution is the person who's actually actively listening and asking questions, right? That's provoking thought. That's just because somebody's a speaker today doesn't mean that everybody isn't of the same status, right? It is not somehow a hierarchical thing to where you are better because you were given a microphone. It's just that you were given a microphone at a certain point in time because that made sense. But there's a whole lot of other people who have just as many valuable things to share and just don't have the microphone at the moment. 
and, and participating in the community by doing that. Like that yep. adds value to it. Right. And all the little behaviors that go along with all the little things then start to influence how that community will start to participate and do. And it just takes a little bit of cancer, if you will, to destroy a conversation, a thing. It'll, it'll take, it'll just, it, it could be the thing that destroys it all, right? It'll, it'll make the behavior something, something that it's not supposed to be. And that's, um, that's pretty sucky. That it's, is. A, it's a great URL, except for the fact that like the government sometimes blocks it. Oh which, no. What? <laughs> Why? I don't, I don't know. They, they don't like their, Oh my goodness. Their United uh, States domain. Oh, it is. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. I'm like, I was wondering how you got the us domain, but it's U.S. and it's US, a government yeah. like country. Do oh, I got it. Oh my goodness. So I love the pillars and I, I think that's so true. Like the people that add value back into the community need to be supported. And I want to know your thoughts really on how you bring these people together. This is something that I've struggled with, with community building is like, there's a lot of meeting people where they're at in dev communities and you have to go into a lot of places. So how do you bring these people to one place? <laughs> well, today I would say I'm failing because we're not even meeting our ticket goals, which is a problem. Um, and I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand today's rules. How about that? Yeah, because that's fair. I'll, I'll say what I, I've done in the past. And what I've done in the past is the intentionality piece. Hey, did you know, excuse me, did you know about this? Would love to have you come. Now, now today, I use a lot of tools to try to help scale that message faster. So looking for certain people or certain types of people to get involved, a lot of, a lot of LinkedIn, a lot of sliding in the DMs, a lot of phone calls, a lot of asking somebody like you, who do you think would be, should be here or need something? And there's a lot of office hours. There's a lot of um, phone calls, text messages. I mean, it's a lot of like marketing and like basically cold calling people and trying to get people involved in like, Get them yep. to where you're at. Yep. Basically, I mean, I mean, that's like running a podcast too. Like we, we have to reach out and get guests and yep, it's just on a larger scale. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, when the, when the pandemic came, it, it created this window for us to focus uh, energy on what did we want to do between the conferences. How do we, I felt like we were failing the community because it's four days, right? Great. But you need support 365 days, right? The four days is great. We're going to hug, we're going to talk. And then I'm going to remember that you, you did something with felt and that, that Clark did. And maybe I could get both of you on a virtual call because I could learn from your mistakes. Yeah. And, and that's really how that.us was born, was to say, could we take meetup.com, Zoom, uh, Stack Overflow, this notion of open spaces, and Slack, and could we just, just like a thread through them? So somebody says, hey, I want to upgrade to Svelte V1. Cool. Well, I'd be the first one to jump on that call and say, what can I share? I don't want you to go through what I've gone through or I don't want to go through what you've gone through, right? And that's, now we're video first online, but we're video first in the way that like you and I are talking, right? It's not yeah. meant to be like, let's sling slides. It's like, let's sling context and talk about real shit because I don't need the quick 
gamified answer so you get points on Stack Overflow. I need the, yeah, I got to do it this way because that's where our authentication system is. Like, there's, I, there's reasons for that stuff. Um, so it's been, it's been hard. I think that's maybe something that a lot of people don't realize too about that conference and that dot us is that it's more than just a conference. Like, I don't know if anyone in the audience, anyone listening has no. went and checked out that dot us and like no. sign up for it and go in there and look at it. Like there's lots of, interactions and things yep. that you can do. And, and I'm at fault for that, right? That's a marketing thing, right? And we have, we have two events. They're the things that pay, that are allowing us to do the online thing, right? Which yeah. takes patience, of which I don't know that I have the best of, but <laughs> right, that window, that window closed, we got it functionally working. That's the same platform that we run our in-person events with. Um, and it's a, it's a balance between, Hey, I got to sell sponsorships. I got to sell tickets. I got to do this. I got a business to run. I got kids to feed. But I mean, you're oh, online upgrading and causing me these week long, like upgrade processes, you know, just, you know, standard run of the mill stuff. Your online model sounds like what everyone wants though. Like it's just no one is going to it like they should be. And like, that's where we need to get people to is to like interact with this thing and realize that discord is great, but this brings like discord in with all those other services you just listed and allows you to do so much more with it. Yeah. I mean, we're, I would say we're at the beginning stages of all that, but yeah, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I don't know if you ever saw the thing on LinkedIn where there's a, there was a meme of a, it was like a support, it was a support office, like IT support office. And it was a picture mm -hmm. of a Range Rover or something. And somebody came in for support and then already walked around the Range Rover and there was a tech guy <laughs> putting shit into the database. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can honestly say I sit here and I struggle with, what is online versus in person versus us selling tickets versus what's just happening? There's, you know, there's, we have uh, three years of, you know, kids leaving schools, entering the workforce who think that this is reality. It's like, uh, no, not really. <laughs> it's going right? to be a hard, hard lesson learned for them, right? Yeah, because, you know, in some places, the pendulum has swung so far for corporate America that they're like, oh, well, we hired too many dudes, so let's hire all women. It's like, okay, but that doesn't, is that the right answer? Like, I agree. That's a problem that needs to get fixed. It's needed to get fixed for decades, but you can't just arbitrarily say, oh, we're just going to hire all women. Like, okay. <laughs> now, now when you have to go back and fire somebody because you just randomly made an arbitrary decision, now you got another problem, right? So it's, it's, you see the corporations that have cut uh, training budgets, travel budgets, this, yeah. that, hire too fast, right? And it's like- Layoffs. Right, right? Yeah, like it's no surprise that whatever 70 some thousand folks got laid off like really i mean i wasn't shocked by that we all know some programmer that's sitting at home who's only working two or three hours a day i mean sorry to call it out but yeah you probably deserve to be fired not not really doing your job and like you on other ends there's a whole lot of people that didn't deserve to be fired and you're just caught up in bad decisions and that's it was that hiring too fast. Like you said, it yep. was the market was going boom, boom, boom and up, up, up. And everybody was like looking for growth. And then as soon as the market. Playing crashed, a different, playing an old playbook on an, on a temporary strategy on a temporary thing. And now we're, we're, I don't know, hopefully at the end of said craziness and does it normalize itself again? I, I mean, I don't, I have, n I have no idea what's going to happen. We could see the future. We would be <laughs> very no rich. Idea. No idea. Cause like I said, I asked, I'm out reaching. Hey, did you want to, are you going to conferences? No, absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
That's what I wish I could help you solve. I wish I had like the magic key to this like community building thing and marketing yourself. Like I don't have that, but I, I do wish that I could help you in some way because I think what you have created, the idea behind all of this too, is just so genuine and great. And like, I, you just want to help people and bring people together. I, I, I genuinely appreciate it, especially right now because this is a pretty dark time and I don't know that there is a secret answer and I think if anybody who who is listening today I would say authentically get involved in whatever that it is right like go build some deep relationships in person isn't online and don't don't confuse the two right use the two one gives you scale right the other should give you like lifelong like change your life shit. And yeah. if you're not treating the in-person, whatever that is, as such, then you're doing it wrong in the first place, right? If you think that going to a conference is about education, then you're mistaken because it's about exposure. You're not going to go and get educated like you would if you went to MIT or whatever, your local community college. No, you might. I mean, half the time you don't even know what the top titles are before you get there. And so you don't really know what you're learning. Right. But you get exposure really, really fast to a set of decisions that have been made that could alter the course of where you're going to go. Right. And if you think of it like that, then you look at the money aspect of it and you say, well, how am I going to invest in myself? Are you like, I'm the person that says, cool. I'll spend a hundred dollars on Talinsky or um, Amy or quick. Like I'll give him a hundred dollars all day long for an hour's worth of thing that I didn't have to go figure out. Yeah. Right? That's compounding my time for a little bit of cash, a thousand dollar investment in a conference. Like that's not a lot of money. I know. Look, our industry is already at the like top, 3% of earners. Like, I love right. it when people come and they tell me like, oh, I couldn't possibly afford to go to that. I'm like. But almost every terrible. company has an education stipend too, which is the other thing. And I, I just want to touch on this. Like we're wrapping up here, but I want to say, so the Wisconsin event is in the summer. Kids sure. are out of school. It's family friendly. You bring everybody. What was the thing with Texas with the idea and the timing and do you think that's maybe playing a part? Okay. So Wisconsin, clearly at the height of travel season, it means everything is more expensive. Your room costs, whatnot. Mm -hmm. It was an active decision knowing that your kids could attend with you, right? Yeah. It's also easy for us because it's in the summer and my kids are off and whatnot. So we picked summer, right? It was originally in August pandemic hit. We were able to bump up to the end of July. Um, we've hit a certain level of which um, one event, think of like writing. Um, I, I think this analogy will work. Get on a unicycle, right? It's, I've never ridden one because I can't, but you get on. It takes a lot of effort to get on right? And you're just driving one wheel. But if you got two wheels, right? Now a bicycle, you can drive a little bit better, but you need more stuff. And at yeah. some point you get to a car, an 18 wheel or whatnot. When we were small, the unicycle effect worked, right? You can kind of spin up, shut down. We were growing with it. In 2019, we had 1,800 people attend Wisconsin. That's a whole different ball of wax. You got $30,000 in t-shirts, right? It's a FedEx truck. Wow. It's not right? Like, it's not like you can fill up your van. It's a, it's the back of a FedEx truck. Like it's full, it's 50 some boxes worth of stuff. So we've, we've hit a certain scale where the costs are, are higher because of it. But yet if we add another event, like adding another wheel, then we get to dilute some of the costs between, well, the team is only, there's only five of us. So I have one full-time, myself and my 
biz partner, wife. Um, and then we've got a sales guy now who works part-time um, and an assistant. And that's it. That's, that's the team. So when's another time I could do it? Well, the exact opposite of when July is. So that's January. And you live in Michigan and I live in Illinois. And <laughs> I don't want to be here in January. So there's a Kalahari in Round Rock. And when they started building, started talking about that, we said, great, I'd like to do it there in January. And that was like five years ago. And is that a great time? No, but the travel, it's, it's an easier travel destination to go there than it is to go to Wisconsin. So for us to serve kind of nationally, Round Rock's a much better, much better destination. It's a bigger hotel. We get better deals on, well, at least rooms because of the time of year. Now we're sacrificing a little bit of family because it's January. So, yeah, I, I wondered about that too, because kids would just be going back to school. So unless you have a way to get them to school and it's a different crowd, right? It, it is. I mean, it's, it's a, it can have the same name and it can have the same logo, but it's always going to, it'll be different no matter what, like it's its own culture. Um, and there's not a time where I could do it as easily in the summer to have kids like, yeah, I do it over Christmas. Like that's grounds for divorce. <laughs> Thanksgiving. No, not long enough. Like I don't want to ruin my Thanksgiving spring break. Well, nobody's spring breaks line up. So there's not really, I can't do two in the summer because the team just, I mean, we just physically couldn't do it. Yeah. So. There's not a time when the kids are really like just out all at the same time. And it's, that's a difficult, right. and I, I, I get like not making it fa this one family friendly, but just attracting maybe a different I'm, type of. We still have family. We still have family sessions. There's, it's just not to the same. I mean, we, right now we have 60, 70 family members coming kids and, and spouses. And we have, six or seven sessions versus, you know, Oh, a smaller scaled down version. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we had to grow into it, but right now we have a kind of a cost problem of it has become funny. It's underwater right now. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm funding it. I'm like that's, that's not a, that's not a recipe for longevity, if you will. Yeah. And, for and I think that that's something that every, like you with the podcast, anybody who runs a user group, we, we, people tend to shy away from like the sponsorship and money aspect of things. But I would, I would tell you and I would tell anybody else, go find a sponsor because the worst thing you can do is start having an impact and then suddenly go away. Yeah. Because now everything that you've built and those who depend on you you just ripped the rug out from. So if you can't make it financially viable for you to make it work, and whatever that means, if that means staff, fine. If that means contractors and services and all that, fine. But if you rip the rug out from somebody, did you do more harm by doing it in the first place? Did you waste people's time? I, I would, I think I you're, seeing these, point. you're seeing these user groups die now because... They did not have a good, they were, they were a, too altruistic, which is great, but they were also tired and they were spending too much time and they weren't financially viable in the first place because some of them were paying from out of their own pockets or they got, didn't have backload of cash. And so the pandemic came, they got a break and then they were like, I'm not starting this up again. Like I wasn't getting... I wasn't getting paid in the first place and I was losing a bunch of time. Why am I going to start all over? Because, we're, because that chunk of time, no matter how we want to say, has started everybody over, myself included. 10 years, 12 years, doesn't matter. It's all starting over again. Sure. And it's almost big, relearning like how to like, figure out society because society's right. changed. Right. And then my big ass user group list that, or email list, that doesn't matter. doesn't matter if nobody wants to come, right? Yeah. Well, I hope that with, like you said, the market is kind of turning around. So hopefully 
with that, we will see some changes for ticket sales and things will be good for the conference. I, I, I hope that people just start to step out, really support one another, stop with the toxic bullshit, you know, invest in themselves. I just, it's not just a me problem. And I like, I, it's, <laughs> there are plenty of others who are all kind of suffering from the same thing. And it's going to take the community of everybody to get everybody like pointing back in the right direction or in a different direction. Right. I, I don't, whatever that is for today. Yeah, I agree. All right. Let's transition over to our picks. I'm going to add my screen up there. First, I just want to point out that dot us, go check it out. Um, Go to thatconference.com. That takes you to the in-person events. Yep. Sign up for just sign up for all of it. Like buy a ticket to the conference, <laughs> sign up for the website, get involved in the community. It is really an amazing place. And we can go over. Give to me, the, give me feedback. It's felt like, yeah, <laughs> done it all. Building it's and all kit, through all the pain, but Yeah. Just go and check it out. I mean, you have amazing keynote speakers. You have James Quick. You have Becca. And there is one other one that I am Whirly. feeling. I'm sorry. Whirly, William Hurley. Whirly. William Hurley. Okay. So, the I mean, king, he's amazing. The king of quantum computing. The king of quantum computing. Nice. So, I mean, there's just so much going on. And like you said, it's scaled down a little bit for like family friendly stuff, but it's really like an amazing, like Kalahari Resort is incredible. It's really a fun place. And on that note, the call for speakers for Wisconsin opens January 1st. So if you go to that.us, WAC, CFP, go sign, go get a profile. You can go submit your, submit your session. And the lineup will get announced in April. Sweet. You so, can also become a counselor. Yep. Nice. Yeah, go That's, get those call for papers out and check out that.us. So I'm going to let you go first for picks. Um, we'll talk about your first one. All right. The first one is remarkable. I, um, it was a gift from... Um, my business partner it i like to write in fact in this past year i picked up writing with a fountain pen oh um, my goodness <laughs> so um but i just like to write I, i've got all the tools um a lot of um, i'm in a couple uh, entrepreneurial things and a lot of folks use these um and i started using them fell in love with it and got one for christmas and i haven't put it down since I'm, nice. I'm a big fan. Now I have, I'm a big fan of iPad. Um, and I've got like the paper, what is it? Paper like paper. There's a film you can put on the iPad to make it feel like paper. Oh, to make it feel like paper. Yeah. I didn't know that. I think it's called paper like or paper, paper something. Mm. Um, but this, you know, right tool, right job focused at writing long battery life. It's super, you know, iPads, a chunk. It's got one work. job. It's, and it's it does that. <laughs> I mean, this thing. Super thin. Um, it is the thickness of a USB C. Wow. USB C, you know, cable or port plug, whatever. So I'm a big fan, you know? Awesome. I'm excited for you. All right. Your second pick? All right. So, tasks. Um, I have a lot of personas, live a couple different lives. Um, I work in front. I have two businesses. That means two different calendars, home, personal life. Um, we use ClickUp for kind of task management and that. Um, and so Sansama gives you a really good sit down, plan your day. It's integrated with all of those different things. And I can literally drag like, I want to do this at nine o'clock. I've got this meeting. I got this meeting so I can daily plan my day. And then in Sansama say, okay, check it off. It's done. It'll go updated in 
wherever the authoritative place is. Now you could add them in here as well, um, but I typically keep, well, business stuff and business stuff and then, you know, personal stuff in like Todoist or, or in Sansama. It's on all the platforms. And then at the end of the day, you can reflect and you can say, hey, where did I spend my time? Because you can put like planned an hour, actual nine hours, um, and it'll bump things forward so you can plan your week out. So it's a, it's a, it's a really, really good tool. Like I like this. I think I'm going to have to check it out because it sounds like it aggregates everything that you need, especially when you have multiple calendars. And that's something that I struggle with. Yeah. I'll open up like three different Chrome profiles and look at my calendars and try to figure out like what my day is going to look like. But this does all of that for you. Well, speaking of calendars, so I use Fantastical. Um, and it has all of my calendars from the different things on it. Fantastical. Uh, Maybe I need another <laughs> pickup here. <laughs> yeah, Fantastical is great, um, at least for us Apple users. Um, oh, is it Apple only? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I will have to see. Is it an app for your phone? Uh, it's more of a service. Okay. Uh, it might be an Apple only thing. App. I mean, it is an app on the Apple store, but I'm not seeing like a website or. But it is, it is. Whiteybits.com is that? Yep. Yep. Okay. So I have all my calendars plugged into that. I use that. I have, I have. It is Apple only, which rules me out. I have a Samsung phone and a Windows PC. So I am. Well, You'll have to find the equivalent of that, but it is, yeah. it is nice to have a calendar that looks at all the calendars. And the reason I fell on Fantastical was because, you know, a lot of people use like Calendarly. My problem is I have different domains for the different businesses, whatnot, but my life is one. So Fantastical will give you the Calendarly like thing. I can do it two ways. I could give you a link and you could pick out time on my calendar. And I have oh. different links. So I can say, if I want you to meet with me for unspecified, cool, I could give you an unspecified link. And that can have one set of openings. But what it does is it looks across all of my calendars to see if any of the other calendars are blocking that one. Or oh, nice. I could give you the inverse and I could propose some times to you. And then you could pick out which one works for you. So, um, mm. but Again, I go to Sansama in the day. In the morning, I do my planning. I grab that stuff off my calendars. I grab my tasks from whatever I'm working on, GitHub, ClickUp, whatnot, jam it all in there, try to see if I'm productive. And this is fantastical. Yep. So you wanted to check that out. All right. We've got a couple of books. books. So two books. I just finished reading Make Time. Um, it has led me to... Um, Things like, I, I now no longer have anything on my home screen. There's no, there's no email. There's no, um, there's no distractions. Um, it's really just about refocusing your time and how to make better usage of your time. And it was a quick read. Um, I, I feel like there's a theme here. There is a little bit of a theme here. And, then, <laughs> and, you know, we've all been in a place where you get to the end of the day and you're like, what the hell did I do? Like, why did I, did I do what I really wanted to do? So if you go to the next one, this will take you like 45 minutes to read and hundred quotes that'll save your life or change your life. And it's just deep thinking, right? Big old, big text. Like it's just great. It's well worth whatever it is. 14 bucks. I don't know. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm going to have to check all those out. All right. So my picks, I picked Minecraft because we started playing probably two or three weeks ago with our kids. And now I am just addicted to it. Like my kids love it just to like build and do things. And that's apparently what I like to do too. I will just build houses for hours. <laughs> it gets kind of my creative side out, but, uh, I'm kind of scared of the deep, dark caves and all the monsters that come out of here, but it's been fun playing with the kids. My, my kids as teenagers still, they'll still get on and play Minecraft. Yeah. It's crazy. Like it's the most popular game in the world, I think. Is it? Yeah. I mean, it's played by the most people. 
All That's right. And my last pick is skeleton.dev. And this is something that really excites me. We did a spelt siren stream with Chris from Skeleton and talked about like how it started, what it is. And basically it's a component library, but it's focused on spelt and it's built off of Tailwind. So it starts with your Tailwind base. And then you have your Svelte components that are all like built in Svelte. So I can just drop them in, which is really nice. Mm. And you also have utilities that use Svelte actions that allow you to like easily do things like a uh, light and dark mode switch or local storage stores, like really simply. Mm. It's so much stuff in here that I'm, I just redid the Siren site. I finished it today and put the PR up on adding skeleton in and I think we're going to use this on the rewrite of coding cat.dev too. You just, I mean, we use tailwind and I've been a pretty, pretty big fan of it. Yeah. Um, I didn't think about it in the way you just said it, which I don't know. You triggered something for me, which meant, okay, I, I get it a little bit more now. And I'm going <laughs> to, have you used chat GPT? I, I've, once and I've heard things. So, so I was like, let's see. Um, make me a Svelte kit site that um, uses Tailwind and makes a landing page, or it was something like that. What did it do? It did it. What? And I was like, Hell no. <laughs> so, but then I was like, okay, I've been in this game for a while. Who's better? And of course it was rudimentary, like create a component, import that component, do the thing. But what I found really interesting was how it used Tailwind, which was exactly opposite of what I did. And it really leveraged like CSS variables inside of Svelte and like, and then getting them to Tailwind. And I was like, huh that's a really interesting idea. Like I never really thought about it that way. And I'm like, damn it, damn it. So, AI. One of my qualms with Tailwind, I love Tailwind and it gives you a very good baseline, but it's not the full design system. It's just those tokens basically that you need to build your components with the building yep. blocks that you need. And if you don't build the actual components themselves, like that's what skeleton gives you is it gives you a button. It gives you a card. It gives yep. you some of the pieces like put together yep. that yep. you need to yep. actually like, keep built. your system. Yep. And I've built all of my own. Can I share my screen? Yeah, absolutely. The last thing I wanted to show on this too, is they have this really cool theme generator and then you can switch your mm. themes with this thing. But like the, Oh, the sea foam is based on the sirens theme too, Look but you can go in there and customize everything. Um, yeah, I can stop sharing and then you can present and I will throw yours up. But I'm so happy you joined us and we will catch everyone next time. Thank you for having Bye. me.